Hi, I'm John Swallow, former Attorney General. Today we're going to re be reviewing some of the iconic film and television scenes um, about the legal system and trying to decide what's real and what's not real and how it could impact you in a courtroom scene. So get out your popcorn and let's go. So the first clip we're going to watch is from A Few Good Men, and it's about a plea bargain that happens not in an office, not in a courtroom, but actually on a softball line. And where, incidentally, when I was Attorney General, we had a Attorney General softball team. So this is not that far from reality. By a factor of 10. Kathy. Let's try it again. Kathy! Dave, you seem distraught. We were supposed to meet in your office 15 minutes ago to talk about the McDermott case. You're stalling on this thing. Now, we either get it done, and I mean now, or no kidding, Kathy. I'm going to hang your boy from a yard arm. Yard arm. All right, it's apparent here that Tom Cruise is a defense lawyer and the person in uniform is a prosecutor and they were supposed to meet and he's really upset. Does that matter? Does it make a difference if you make a prosecutor upset in your case? Let's see what happens. Sherby, does the Navy still hang people from yard arms? I don't think so. Dave Sherby doesn't think the Navy hangs people from yard arms anymore. I'm going to charge him with possession and being under the influence while on duty. You plead guilty, I'll recommend 30 days in the brig with loss of rank and pay. It was oregano, Dave. It was $10 worth of oregano. Yeah, well, your client thought it was marijuana. My client's a moron. That's not against the law. But, Kathy, I got people to answer to just like you do. I'm going to charge him. With what? Possession of a condiment? You can tell here that there's a disparate of ability and, uh, and really con real conviction in this scenario. By the way, I love this scene. I think it's a perfect representation of a lawyer who's really engaged in defending his client and a prosecutor who's probably overworked, underpaid, and really doesn't have much to lose either way, but he's trying to bluff his way into a positive result for who? For the government, his superior officers. So the lawyer defending is representing a real person with real rights. The prosecutor is really just representing an institution. And you'll see as we go forward, it makes a huge difference. And by the way, I think this is a marvelous example of what a great lawyer can do for a good case with a good defendant. Kathy. Dave, I tried to help you out of this, but if you ask for jail time, I'm going to file a motion to dismiss. You won't get it. I will get it. And if the MTD is denied, I'll file a motion in limine seeking to obtain an evidentiary ruling in advance. And after that, I'm going to file against pretrial confinement. And you're going to spend the next three months going blind on paperwork because a Sigmund in second class bought and smoked a dime bag of oregano. Let's go. McCaffrey understands the kryptonite of the prosecution. This guy does not want to prosecute. He does not want to move the case forward. He does not want to stay up late at night working on these spurious motions. He wants to get rid of this case, and he's willing to do anything to do it. And McCaffrey knows it, and he's being an advocate the kind of advocate we all hope we have if we're ever in a bind, especially in something this minor. B misdemeanor, 20 days in the brig. C misdemeanor, 15 days restricted duty. I don't know why I'm agreeing to this. You have wisdom beyond your years. Case is over. It's done. And it's done a great job. Hollywood got it right on this one. And you can thank your lucky stars that we have the privilege of looking at something this effective done this way. I'm a fan of this scene. Just a little bit of something about plea bargains, by the way. A plea bargain can happen at any time, and that's where a prosecution and a defense agree to terms. And there's a lot of back and forth, and one of the keys that is kind of manifest here is that McCaffrey, the, the lawyer for the defendant, kind of knew the hot button key points to make with the prosecutor, and it all came together in a classic characterization of what a plea bargain can be when it's done right. The, the next clip we're going to watch is the famous scene in the trial of Al Capone in the movie Untouchables, where the judge orders the switching out of the jury. Bailiff, I want you to switch the juries. Let me say this. That would never happen. There would be an investigation immediately. There would be calls for a mistrial. It would never happen. Now, what really happens in real life is sometimes a juror, one juror or two jurors, will become tainted during the progression of the trial. And that's why they call, almost always assign, appoint alternative jurors who can fill in in case a juror gets sick, uh, incapacitated, or becomes contaminated. But you'd never see a switch out of the whole jury. 
There aren't enough alternative jurors who are watching the trial, and so it's just really a ridiculous uh, example of what doesn't happen in a courtroom. Sir. Your Honor, I object. What did you tell him? I told him his name was in the ledger, too. His name wasn't in the ledger. Hey, wait a second, wait a second, what is this? Is this the law? What's going on over here? You're out. Of, You're out of order. What's going on I over think here? That we, I don't care what you Almost every state, if not every state, has what's called a judicial conduct commission. And so if a judge is accused of anything improper in a, in a trial setting or in a case, that can be reported to a group that oversees, overlooks, and holds judges accountable uh, and against corruption. So again, this would never happen in real life, and a mistrial would be called, and a judge would never order this, because a judge is smart enough to know that they can be looked at for anything. So the judge would have to recuse himself in real life, and this would never occur. Do something over here. What do I look like to you, huh? Do something. Do something. Order! Your Honor, we would like to withdraw our plea of not guilty and enter a plea of guilty. Order in the court! Order! Now, the last ridiculous thing about this is that it's not the, the defense attorney who enters a plea of guilty, it's the accused. And so a lawyer could never enter a plea of guilty or not guilty on behalf of a client unless that was the client's wishes. So it's ridiculous on multiple levels, but it's still a fun scene. Everybody's seen it, it's iconic, and it's exactly what would never happen in a real court of law. This last clip is a scene from Better Call Saul and Jimmy is defending an alleged criminal in, a, in an iconic scene, which I think is possible. So we've had two discussions. One was a, a great example of great lawyering, and the other was like, this is ridiculous, this would never happen. This scene portrays something that could conceivably happen, and depending on state law and the rules of professional conduct in a particular jurisdiction, the defense just might get away with it. Watch on. Is the person who robbed you present in the court today? Yes. And could you point him out to the court, please? Damn. Let the record show that the witness has identified the defendant, Mr. Seiki. Now, let me just jump in here. The cross-examining attorney here, the defense attorney, knows something that no one else in the courtroom knows except maybe one or two other people, and that is the defendant and the person sitting in for the defendant. And so his job is to get the witness to commit and like a trout on a hook or a fly to commit hard. So watch how effectively he makes this witness commit unequivocally, which is important to the jury because the jury is going to take this eyewitness testimony to the bank, going to swallow the hook whole, back to my trout metaphor, and it's really going to help the defendant here. Thank you, Mr. Harkness. Your witness, Mr. Goodman. Thank you for coming in today, Mr. Harkness. I just want to clarify a few things from your testimony, if that's okay. Okay. So, you were working at the Sandia Mart the night of the 30th, is that correct? Got in at noon and left at midnight. That's a long day. Mm -hmm. Good for you. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a hard day's work. So, you say, a man came in and he reached across the counter and, uh, quote, he grabbed up the money from my register and run off. Yeah. And there was no one else in the store? Not at that time, no. And since the camera system wasn't working at the time, you're the only one who saw the perpetrator? Yeah, I guess so. You see how he's setting this up? He's, he's going through any possible loopholes that the prosecution might want to jump through thereafter, saying that maybe there's another witness, but this witness has just confirmed that there were no other witnesses. And then he's going to talk about how tired he must have been and the witness is going to talk to that. This, this very effective cross-examiner who knows what's going to come in, in a minute is doing everything possible to just shut down any alternative except for one. And that is that this eyewitness cannot be trusted and that the, he identified the wrong person as the culprit. Yeah, so... 
This person came in and they bought something. I think it was an Almond Joy. And they bought an Almond Joy. And when you rang them up, that's when they snatched the cash from the register. Sounds like it happened pretty fast. But you say you got a good look at them, correct? Yes. <laughs> you must drink stronger coffee than I do, because after 11 hours on the job, I can barely see straight. And it was dark out. Well, he's the only guy that came in that night that wasn't made up like a bat or a cat or whatever the hell those guys are. And he was right up in my face. Right in your face. And according to your testimony, you feel confident that you can identify this person. That's what you're saying. I can. Everyone in the courtroom is thinking that this lawyer is dead in the water, that he's searching for something that would kind of impeach or question the credibility, the recollection, the vision, the attention span of this witness. And this witness is rising to the occasion and saying, no, no, I'm emphatically going to nail this down. I know the person who did this crime in my store. I can identify this person. I don't want there to be any doubt at all. And that's exactly what this good cross-examiner is doing to set up this witness. I love this. Absolutely. It's him, your client. Are you sure that's the person? There's no doubt in your mind. Take your time. I don't need time. That's him. Now, would you be surprised to learn, Mr. Harkness, that the person you just pointed to is not the defendant? What? And my client is in the back of the courtroom. Mr. Sakey, would you please stand up? Objection. Now, the person you ID'd is named Hollis Early. He's a bartender down in Berlin. What? He has a very good alibi for the night in Your question. Your Honor, objection. Isn't this great? So after he set the stage, set him up, put clamps down it, the trout had eaten the hook, hook, line, and sinker, this amazing cross-examiner springs the trap ends the show basically the only the only question is 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 this legal is this tactic ethical and it may come down to which state you're in or which jurisdiction in terms of the bar rules of professional conduct would uh, sanction such a stunt the judge is going to come out of his chair on this um, the prosecution may call for a mistrial on this but at the end of the day Eyewitness testimony in this case was so powerful and so emphatic that it does a lot to show the jury that this eyewitness cannot be trusted. And that the, the sad thing about this, this type of thing is in many cases, our eyewitnesses are the least reliable witnesses in any kind of a criminal trial. And that surprises a lot of people. They think, no, 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 eyewitness is the only sure way to convict a person, but that's just not the case. Many cases that are later overturned are overturned when it comes out that the eyewitness wasn't wearing glasses or um, the, the light was obscure, the moon wasn't out that night like the eyewitness said it was. And there's a lot of pressure sometimes placed on a witness, an eyewitness by a prosecution to be more emphatic than the witness actually feels. In this case, what would have been tragic is if this defendant had been convicted merely because of where he sat next to his lawyer as the apparent accused, which is the whole point of this scene, showing that many times people are convicted just because of where they're sitting, not for anything that they've done. Fascinating. Um, more realistic than the, than the situation with the untouchables, right? But certainly something that could conceivably happen and something a good defense lawyer could conceivably get away with. Oh, oh Mr. Oh. Goodman. You didn't recognize him either, Your Honor. All right, settle, settle down, everybody. Settle, settle. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we're going to call it a day. I will have very specific instructions for you tomorrow. But as always, please refrain from discussing the case until then. And I will see counsel in my chambers now. And that's not going to be a fun meeting, but it looks like it worked for the defendant. And for a criminal defense attorney with everything on the line, sometimes you'd be surprised at the kinds of tricks they'll play to prove the innocence of their client or to impeach the credibility of a witness on the stand. And I think that wraps it up pretty well. Well, I hope that you enjoyed the clips and a little bit of popcorn to boot. Um, those were three great scenes. One that shows a very good lawyer and what a very good lawyer can do for you. The cross-examination in Better Call Saul was amazing as well as he nailed down that witness. I hope what you got out of this is that your lawyer makes a difference. 
And if we can help you find the right lawyer for your case, I invite you to click the link below and let us know how we can best help you, help us understand your case, your legal situation, and put our great lawyers to work for you so that whatever happens, you don't get treated like Al Capone did in his case and have your lawyer plead guilty for you when that just doesn't happen in the real world. So thanks for your time, and I hope you enjoyed it, and look forward to seeing you on the next video. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you had as much fun as I had. And uh, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell. And be sure and watch this next video.